Welcome to the Ukrainian Crisis Media Center. And today our topic is uh, European integration of the Western Balkans in the sites of Russian propaganda. Uh, today we will talk about uh, Russian attempts to undermine the idea of European integration among uh, Western Balkan societies. And uh, I will host the event, Volodymyr Solovyan, head of the Hybrid Warfare Analytical Group at the Ukraine Crisis Media Center. Our guest today is uh, Samir Ibishevich, president of uh, non-governmental organization PROI, Bosnia and Herzegovina, as well as Ukraine. And also uh, Katerina Zemkevich joins us, analytical center for Balkan studies. Yehor Brelan, PhD, analyst at the center for NGO studies, detector media. And also, we have a pleasure today to um, meet with um, Darko Bradovich, national security and hybrid warfare expert at the Center for Strategic Analysis, Serbia. And uh, also our guest today is Lubomir Filipovic, political scientist, Montenegro. So, for decades, uh, Russia has invested uh, millions of uh, dollars for spreading its influence over the Western Balkans. However, after the large-scale invasion at Ukraine, there occurred a shift regarding the attitude of local societies towards the Russian stance. However, the Kremlin does not give up. And for example, just in spring of 2022, Russia increased its information influence in Serbia by opening RT, RT Balkan in Belgrade. So we may talking about uh, Russian attempts to spread its information influence regarding uh, all the narratives that uh, Russia tries to impose regarding Ukraine and the West as a whole. And uh, Russia often tried to impose local uh, and tried to use local narratives to undermine the European idea among Western Balkans uh, societies. That is uh, quite actual for Ukraine regarding the stance among European political elites that uh, EU should not prioritize Ukraine over Western Balkans when we are talking about uh, accession talks. That's why I, will, I would like to start with uh, Katerina and uh, uh, I, I'm asking her to give us uh, your point of view regarding uh, the, uh, the issue whether the European integration of Ukraine really depends on success of the Western Balkan candidates' countries. So please, Katrina, floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Vladimir. Uh, hello, uh, everyone. Um, I wish a good uh, discussion and um, Sorry if I have a uh, different little um, take uh, in uh, English, um, uh, and maybe uh, my internet is not good uh, works uh, uh, because we ha uh, in, in Croatia we have uh, a strong uh, line. So, um, the European Commission uh, in the uh, early of uh, November adopted um, uh, Europe uh, adopted uh, uh, a report uh, about uh, issues uh, of the uh, six uh, uh, Western Balkan uh, countries: uh, Ukraine, Georgia, uh, Moldova. And uh, a big uh, part of this uh, report uh, uh, will uh, deal um, to, uh, to the Western uh, Balkan countries. Uh, European Commission uh, underlines uh, that all countries uh, demonstrated uh, positive uh, din uh, dynamic uh, in, um, uh, du uh, during uh, uh, 2023, uh, uh, especially in area of rule of law, uh, the fight uh, against uh, corruption and uh, organized uh, crime, and uh, all um, uh, all Western Balkan countries uh, had a good tendency in 
public management, uh, electoral uh, system, uh, a good um, result uh, in uh, adopting uh, some uh, reforms. But the Europe uh, Commission uh, uh, states uh, that uh, um, Serbia and Kosovo uh, continue uh, continue uh, um, problem uh, with uh, process of normalization and uh, this uh, problem Russia Russian propagandists uh, are using uh, for uh, share uh, disinformation misinformation and um, propaganda narratives uh, in uh, uh, Serbia and Kosovo and uh, wider uh, Balkan uh, region. Uh, also, uh, report, uh, report uh, of uh, European Commission underline uh, that um, uh, all uh, Western Balkan uh, countries uh, will continue uh, to implementation uh, reform, including the uh, enlargement uh, process. Uh, especially European uh, Commission um, uh, states uh, that uh, Kosovo and Serbia uh, need, uh, need to continue uh, normalization uh, process and uh, um, European Commission uh, um, uh, um, have a request from uh, European Foreign uh, Council uh, to uh, include um, uh, this uh, uh, process uh, for um, uh, Serbian uh, negotiation process uh, with uh, European uh, Union. Uh, also, European Commission recommended uh, to uh, start the uh, um, opening process for uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina if uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, in uh, March this uh, year uh, will demonstrate uh, good results in uh, some uh, reforms uh, uh, which need uh, to uh, open in uh, uh, European uh, process uh, negotiation. Thank you. in-depth analysis and uh, now I, I would like to turn to Ihor Brailan. Uh, he recently he wrote a great article at Detector Media and I strongly recommend uh, to our audience to to read it, uh, to get an acquaintance about it. So Ihor, please tell us um, how does the Russian propaganda operate in the Balkans? This is the uh, actual name of your article, so what is your uh, main findings, and maybe you will tell us more about main pillars Russia used to impose its narratives uh, among societies of the Western Balkans. Uh, yes, hello, thank you, Volodymyr, uh, for invitation and uh, organization such a great event. And uh, that article won't be possible without uh, great and insightful expertise of Katrina Shemkevich. And uh, she has been researching uh, the topic of uh, politics in the Balkans uh, for years. Um, and uh, in my article, I outline um, the main Russian actors in Balkans. Uh, those are five main actors. Uh, first of all, it's Orthodox Church. And uh, Russia is using uh, Orthodox Church uh, as a weapon in uh, the hybrid war not only against Ukraine, but also in Europe. Secondly, it uh, media, and uh, Russia uh, is using the main propaganda media, such as uh, Russia Today or Sputnik, for example, in Serbia. Uh, yes, we know that the European Union uh, uh, blocked uh, uh, blocked uh, these uh, channels after the full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, in March 2022. However, they are still operating. Uh, the third uh, Russian actor in uh, Balkans uh, is the Russian diaspora. And uh, when we look back uh, in the history, especially after the First World War, 
uh, a lot of uh, Russian uh, military, for example, uh, of White Army, uh, they moved uh, to the Balkan countries such as uh, Bulgaria, Serbia, Greece, and uh, they continued to work and live there, and that's why we have like the fifth Russian column uh, in the Balkans. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, there were also two other Russian actors uh, in uh, the Balkans, uh, but uh, I would like to say that uh, for us uh, in Ukraine, uh, the Balkan countries were actually forgotten, and we didn't uh, mention uh, about these uh, countries, especially the countries in the Western Balkans, uh, countries of uh, former Yugoslavia, uh, because uh, we were focused mainly on the United States of America, the United Kingdom, France and Germany, due to their role in the negotiations uh, in 2014-2021, the Minsk process and Normandy process. And so uh, the Balkan region was actually at some point lost in uh, the Ukrainian information policy, and uh, it's a big uh, it's a big uh, problem, and uh, we need uh, to fill uh, this uh, gap. And uh, what are the main Russian narratives in the Balkans? Well, first of all is uh, the role of uh, Russia in uh, Yugoslavia was in the 1990s. So uh, Russia always repeats that uh, they helped Serbia when NATO was bombing them in uh, the March of 1999. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they forgot to mention uh, that Ukraine uh, also sent uh, the military aid to Serbia. And uh, that's why Russia is trying to instrumentalize history. Um, and uh, another historical narrative is connected to the role of the Russian Empire in the liberation of uh, the Balkan countries from uh, the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century. Uh, we can talk uh, a lot about the uh, Russian-Ottoman uh, war uh, in 1877-1878. And after that war, uh, Bulgaria became an independent country, and uh, uh, this narrative uh, is uh, it's pretty familiar in Bulgaria, in Serbia, uh, also in Greece, uh, but uh, actually Felike Atria was formed in Odessa, and uh, there are a lot of uh, connections between Ukraine and Greece, and we can't forget about it. Um, so, uh, like, the first big uh, part of Russian propaganda in the Balkans is history. Uh, the second one uh, is uh, connected to bad NATO, due to uh, those NATO bombs in 1999 and also the process of uh, Euro-Atlantic uh, integration of those countries. And, uh, for example, in um, uh, Macedonia uh, and Montenegro, there were a lot of uh, information operations when those countries wanted to join NATO. Um, and uh, that was a big problem at the time, uh, because yes, after the start of the Russian-Ukrainian war in 2014, uh, a lot of people started to talk about uh, the disinformation, how to fight it, but uh, at the same time, uh, uh, the main solution is to spread your own narratives in uh, those countries. And uh, the third very important point uh, regarding Balkans is uh, um, the forming of negative image of Ukraine refugees in uh, those uh, countries. And uh, Russia is portraying them as uh, 
mostly middle class people who don't need uh, to get uh, uh, social support from uh, those countries. That's why uh, why do they need uh, to live there? And uh, this narrative is also connected with uh, the process of uh, European integration of Ukraine because the Russian full-scale invasion uh, galvanized the European Union and uh, Ukraine became uh, got a candidate status and in December 2023 uh, the negotiations uh, were started with the EU um, and Russia is also trying to uh, to wage this information war Another very important point, uh, and uh, Katarina helped me with understanding of media environment of those countries, um, is that uh, pro-Russian media outlets, for example, when we take uh, Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, Croatia, Montenegro, they cite each other. And so uh, there is like uh, up to five, ten uh, main uh, Serbia media outlets, and uh, other ones cite them. Uh, I can uh, name, for example, uh, Telegraph as one of those uh, media which uh, spread Russian uh, propaganda. Uh, uh, so. And even uh, uh, research what was done, uh, for example, by uh, NATO, and uh, I uh, cited uh, a lot of good research uh, what was done by uh, NATO uh, Stratcom. Uh, all those uh, links uh, were, were showed, and uh, this is a good uh, uh, food uh, for discussion uh, here in Ukraine because uh, I can't remember so insightful uh, analysis about uh, particular Z uh, information space. A uh, couple of words about Bulgaria and Bosnia. Um, in Bulgaria uh, there is such a Russian narrative, so like there is a hegemon, the United States of America, and uh, it's like a master of puppets, it wants uh, to uh, conquer other countries, and uh, European countries are victims of this uh, imperialistic policy of the United States of America, and so and Russia is a country with uh, great culture and uh, global ambitions, but I would say that uh, the situation uh, in uh, each uh, of Balkan countries is very different, and uh, from one side uh, we can't uh, say that uh, the information space of uh, uh, former Yugoslavia countries, uh, Bulgaria, Greece uh, and Albania, they are totally pro-Russian, but at the same time, uh, we can't uh, say that uh, in these countries uh, there is much uh, freedom of press. And so uh, our, um, like our main conclusion uh, after I wrote uh, this great article uh, is that uh, we need uh, to research uh, more, particularly the topic of uh, Russian propaganda in the Balkans in terms of um, public opinion about uh, uh, Ukraine uh, in that region. Thanks, Igor. And uh, this is my just uh, short question to you uh, in brief, if you may uh, tell us uh, about your ideas how to promote uh, Ukraine by Ukrainian means in uh, Western Balkan societies, because in your article you, uh, you write that today we have a situation where the where approach to communication must be changed from reactive to proactive. So maybe you have some brief ideas how to, to strengthen Ukrainian presence, I mean, not just on a level of uh, some topics, historical uh, interconnections, uh, which you mentioned before, but maybe uh, from the perspective of uh, toolkit of informational influence of Ukraine? Um, 
I would say that uh, first of all we need uh, to unite uh, Ukrainian diasporas in those countries and uh, when when we would have uh, a horizontal networking a horizontal approach then uh, it will be better to coordinate uh, more interviews with those people uh, in the Balkan media and uh, this is like uh, one point the other point is that uh, uh, we must uh, tell uh, people's stories of this war um, because actually uh, generally uh, Russian Ukrainian war is portrayed uh, in European media as in some kind of a geopolitical approach so it's like uh, Russian imperial war against Ukraine like we have EU NATO United States so um, these uh, people stories for example I don't know uh, IT specialist uh, who joined the armed forces of Ukraine and uh, what uh, he or she is thinking about this war. And the uh, Balkan media, I, uh, um, I suppose they lack uh, such kind of uh, everyday life approach. Um, this is the second point. Uh, so like more, uh, more uh, media engagements with those uh, countries and uh, the third one is uh, to um, to write about how Russian disinformation works in those countries because yes it's very important to write about those links about Russian actors but uh, at the same time, we must explain uh, to our Balkan friends and colleagues how it works in those countries, because it's not only about Russia, Ukraine, it's also about their countries. And uh, I know that, uh, for example, uh, Bosnian society, they don't know so much uh, what, uh, for example, Vladimir Putin thinks about uh, Srebrenica massacre and Srebrenica genocide. Um, so, yes, and uh, another one is uh, like uniting all efforts of uh, civil society, uh, Ukrainians who live there, uh, Ukrainian uh, diplomacy missions, I would like to <coughs> I would like to tell you that, for example, uh, Anatoly Demyshuk, uh, he is a graduate of Kyiv National Rostoshenko University. Uh, he is an expert in uh, Croatian politics. He defended a PhD thesis about the foreign policy of Croatia in the 90s. And uh, he is working now in the Ukrainian embassy in uh, Montenegro. Mm, and uh, it's a good example of uh, bringing together expertise and uh, people who uh, have been working on this particular topic, uh, the Balkan countries, uh, for a while. Thanks so much, Igor. It was a great piece uh, to think about. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, we will sooner or later implement uh, your findings and uh, Ukraine will be voiced much more uh, better among the Western Balkans. So let's move to our partners and colleagues uh, in the region and uh, I'd like to ask uh, Darko Bradovich uh, to tell us about uh, current state of affairs regarding the potential of uh, Russian Federation influence in the context of uh, information uh, destabilization uh, and uh, disruption uh, of the dialogue between Serbia and Kosovo, uh, given current developments, I mean uh, special police operations in the offices of Serbian-led institutions in municipalities of uh, Kosovo, and also uh, uh, late latest uh, uh, policies of uh, Kosovo authorities, uh, they, they try to implement uh, euro currency uh, among, among Kosovo. So that uh, brings us to another, uh, another episode of destabilization. So what is your perspective how Russia may use this situation in its own purposes? Thank you, Volodymyr, for gathering us on this 
distinguish conference. I think that the topics are very important and relevant for the current situation on the Western Balkans. If we want to speak about the Russian role and influence in Kosovo crisis, first of all, we should identify what is the broader uh, Russian task for this region. And this is not the secret. The, their task is to prevent Euro-Atlantic integration of whole region. Always they are using the NATO as a good excuse to oppose actually the European integrations. For them, uh, stopping the European integration is equal to stop the NATO integration. So they do not care what arguments and what, uh, what tools they will use to achieve this goal. And from the beginning, uh, almost 30 years, they are strongly uh, cultivating and investing in the inter-ethnic and inter-religious conflicts. Uh, the wars during the 19s are very good uh, uh, Russian leverage in this area. They use it often and very well still. And one of their priorities is to sustain the ethnic motivated tensions uh, which existed in the 19s. They are through their uh, useful idiots, agents of influence and media campaigns sustaining now. And actually they are in the very huge operation of reconstruction of the mindset of the people, especially Orth Orth Orthodox Serbs, because Russians using the Serbian Orthodox Church as their tool of influence, very strong one, which played on the several fields, politics, media and mouth-to-mouth -mouth actions, actually they are entering into the citizens and populations. And if we watch the Kosovo dispute, it is very clear uh, stated to us from Russia that Serbia should wait Russia to finish in Ukraine and then the Kosovo dispute will be resolved. That was told by notorious Maria Zakharova, that was told by a Russian ambassador in Belgrade in several occasions, and every time when somebody asks, uh, let's say, a, a Russian ambassador what they will do about the position of Serbs, uh, mi minority of Kosovo, he said, wait for us to finish in Ukraine, and then new age are coming, new geopolitical circumstances, and everything will be fine. Actually, we have uh, in the last eight months very active Russian public diplomacy, which is supported by the strategic communications from Moscow, but also they are developed on the ground by the agents of influence, mostly so-called experts, former military of, uh, officials, and also the some public officials of Serbia, which maintaining that narrative that uh, Russia is still the geopolitical relevant player on the Western Balkans. In that sense, Russia using it very strong. Also, the, after the election on the 17th of December in Serbia, Russia uh, 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 supported more this narrative about evil West and evil Euro-Atlantic integration. Actually, they uh, build up the story about Euromaidan, and unfortunately, Serbian official accepted this narrative, which came firstly from the Maria Zakharova, and then it was all, all, all uh, well uh, not, noticed by all of us what happened next. By the Kosovo situation, I think that Russian whole state apparatus uh, working actively to prevent uh, Ohrid agreement, actually the European plan agreement, which was proposed by the French and, and Deutschland, and they want to do any, op uh, any action to prevent it, they will not take. Uh, they will not care about Serbs to achieve that goal, and that is uh, most the most said that uh, majority of Serbs does not understand that they are uh, their emotions, their uh, mindset, and their view of the international relation 
is actually broadly exploited by the Rata for very small geopolitical gains in the Balkans, and they will fuel tensions. And I think that we are now in very risky period of time in by several reasons. Serbia accepted Ohrid agreement. Kosovo accepted uh, Ohrid agreement. Uh, whatever it looks like, this agreement coming to power on the ground, which is very good indicator. And I'm pretty sure that Russians will conduct some more active information operations in the Serbia and the Western Balkans, uh, or, or, or in opposed to other, I thinking that Russia losing the grip in Serbia, maybe it does not look like on the first hand, but by the activities of their foreign ministry and other services, we see that they are very active uh, in this moment, more than they was been active on the beginning of the aggression. And also we can see that in the Putin interview to Tucker Clarkson, on the first beginning of the interview, he used the Serbia as example to justify his aggression of, on Ukraine, which means that the puzzle, which is called Serbia, is one of the top priorities for the Russia. We know that Russians lost the influence on the South Caucasus after 126 years, and I'm also sure now that they are losing the grip on the Balkans. So, I think that the states on the Western Balkans, Serbia in the first hand, should engage more in the countering the Russian disinformation. Our media literacy is on the lowest, the lowest level which can be compared with the some Central Asia or Central Africa states. I think that influence coming uh, by the will, so the people accepting to be the tool of the Russian information, com uh, information campaigns, which is very sad, <coughs> but sorry, but also I think there is a plenty of room for the expert for uh, to, to advocate different solutions, especially on the level of increasing the strategic communication and building the resilience to this information. I also think there is a one narrow space for the better building capacities in our society. But in this moment, I think that most of the uh, of the political parties which are supporting membership in the uh, European Union of Serbia, those parties are very scared to confront their voters and to say something against Putin and especially Russia. And also, the 20, uh, 215 uh, national assemblers in Serbia, which coming from the parties which support in European integration, they are also scared to make the compromise about Kosovo, and that is the space where uh, where Russian strategic communication entering. It is three times which we documented from our center that actually Russia bring the topic to our media. It was not the Russian development of topic, they actually artificially bring it, bring it in. Two times uh, on Kosovo, one time on the election, and unfortunately that was accepted by, by, by our state officials. Uh, I do not know the reasons, but it, this is very discouraging. But also on the other hand, I see positive trends. If we speak about Kosovo, I think that international community must take all advantage towards Kurti. The situation with Dinar is not a good uh, decision. I think that Dinar is not uh, substantial for the compromise solution, and I think that it should be supported, the huge topics, the huge frameworks, and after we have the compromise which both sides agreed on normalization of relations, then should be uh, deployed the bureaucratic uh, measures. So I think that in the future Russia will exploit a lot of the Kosovo dispute, 
And I think that Serbia does not have national resilience to oppose it. We do not have even the the proper, uh, let's say, state level response on minor disinformation. And also we do not have recognition that, that Russia are the hybrid threat. Here, nobody even tracking the disinformation and pre as threat, but also Russia is still not recognized as the threat, but Russia is a real threat for, for the future of the citizens of Serbia. Thanks, uh, Darko, for this great picture of uh, Russian online um, influences uh, over Serbia. And now I, will, uh, I would like to turn to Lubomir Filipovic and ask him about Russian influences in Montenegro. As we all know, many uh, Russians moved to, to Montenegro after the large-scale invasion, uh, and about uh, 30,000 Russians uh, permanently live uh, in uh, Montenegro. So whether this led us to uh, spreading of Russian narratives, or we may talk that uh, these Russians are in opposition to ruling uh, regime in uh, Russia. So uh, given that uh, this is a shift in, uh, in terms of population of uh, Montenegro, how this reflects uh, towards information space in your country? Thank you very much, uh, Volodymyr. Uh, thank you very much for the Ukrainian Crisis Center for inviting me to this event. I think it is very important. Um, I couldn't add more to what uh, my distinguished uh, colleagues have already said. But from Montenegrin point of view, I would like to maybe make some distinctions to, to what Darko was saying. I agree with Darko with most of his uh, conclusions, but when it comes to Montenegro, mm -hmm. it is very important to say that from our point of view, and I think from the Bosnian point of view, and if somebody from Kosovo would be here, that they would agree with me that you couldn't so easily separate Russian influence from, from Serbian influence in the region. There are many analogies in the approach of what Serbia is doing and what Serbia, how Serbia is treating its neighbors to what Russia is doing to its neighbors in the uh, former uh, Soviet Union space. Just as Russia perceives Ukraine part of Ruski Mir, uh, that's the way how Serbia perceives uh, parts of the Balkan as part of the Serbsky Svet, of the Serbian world. Um, <clears throat> unlike other regions and uh, your colleague from, from Kiev was calling, telling about that. And most of the um, narratives that he mentioned are not differing much from what we see and how Russia uh, malign influence operates in Germany, Austria, and other places. With Balkans, it's, it's a bit different. Why? Because in the Balkans, Russia has a great proxy concept, a concept that's, that they're using as a vessel to promote their own interest. And that's Serbian nationalism. And when you speak about Orthodox Church, you should be aware that Orthodox Church in the Balkans is not uh, one monolith structure, but that you have Albanian Orthodox Church, you have Romanian Orthodox Church, you have Greek Orthodox Church, which is now in conflict with Russian Orthodox Church over the question of Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Uh, or Orthodox Church of Ukraine, but I would call it Ukrainian Orthodox Church, as, as I perceive it as the own, solely and the only Ukrainian Orthodox Church, that the Atocephalus Orthodox Church of Ukraine, um, the one uh, that has no Moscow in its name, uh, because the other one is obviously Russian Orthodox Church. Um, so the Serbian Orthodox Church also serves as a vessel for the Russian interests in the Balkans. And if you see in Montenegro how uh, leaders of the Serbian Orthodox Church behave and what are their public statements and how they treat the question of Ukraine and that they're supporting and spreading this information about what's happening uh, with uh, their allies and colleagues in, in Ukraine, uh, 
that you, you just a couple of years ago you had Onufri walking uh, the streets of Montenegro participating in uh, uh, election campaign in Montenegro, what was obviously election campaign in Montenegro. So that's how I would perceive the Russian influence, uh, because Russian influence, Russian soft power is very limited in the Balkans. So we were never part of the Soviet Union. Thank to, thanks to 1948 and Tito's split with Stalin, we exited the uh, influence sphere of Soviet, direct influence sphere of Soviet Union. So we don't know, we're not familiar with contemporary Russian culture. And we are not influenced with contemporary Russian culture. So if your parents in Ukraine still remember uh, Ironia could be for 31st of December, uh, we, we don't know that. We, 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 are, we don't experience that in Montenegro. That's, I am mean, trying to uh, kind of picture to yourself what, what, I, what I consider to be Russian cultural influence over, over, over the Balkans. So what they do, and that's been recognized by Serbian nationalists, and they said it openly in their, they publicly discussed it in their strategical conferences. And they said, Russian cultural influence is limited to classical literature, to classical music, just like in the West, to, to classical arts and, 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 you know, just like Europe uh, and Western Europe and the United States superficially uh, consider the Russian culture, but that's the, that is the same case with, with the Western Balkans. So what they suggested, the Serbian nationalists in Montenegro and other places, is that they can use the power of the Russian state apparatus, the resources, re the resources that they have, in order to push their own agenda in the Balkans. Because as they said, and I'm now talking about, for example, uh, Professor uh, Vladimir Bozovic, the newly elected rector of Montenegrin University, he in 2015 in his working paper on Russian soft influence, mm, he said that Russian and Serbian interests in the Balkans are completely congruent. In the same paper, he used the same narrative to, for example, to um, talk about Ukrainian and Montenegrin nation. And this is exactly where we should be, on what should we be, we sh on, on what we should pay attention. And those are, those are the topics that connect Balkans and Ukraine and Belarus more than other places in the world, because they're using the same narrative. In the same paper, Professor Bozovic said that Ukrainian nation is a made up nation. Um, conspiracy theory that was created in order to um, disintegrate the greater Russian nation. The same narrative was, was, used, was used about Montenegro. That Montenegro was a nation created by the communists, that Montenegrins are Serbs, and that Montenegro is a just a toponym, a geographical term. I think this sounds very familiar to Ukrainians and to the Russian narrative that Ukrainians are non-existent nation, that they are part of the greater Russian nation, and that they were created by Austro-Hungarians. And this is what I've heard last night in Putin's interview with Tucker Carlson. He was using the same narrative. And this is something that's very familiar to us. And those are the same patterns. And this is where we could cooperate. If in Ukraine, um, there is a stronger and, and, and there would be a stronger and understanding of these processes. Uh, we can create tools and methods to fight both Russian and Serbian malign influence in the Balkans or how, how I, I better qualified it as Russia, Russo-Serbian malign influence in the Balkans, because you can't separate the two when it comes to Montenegro, when it comes to Bosnia, when it comes to Kosovo. Uh, Darko was right. By steering inter-ethnic tensions, uh, 
uh, Russia achieves its goals because Russia is questioning and challenging the world order, the existing world order, uh, because they don't like their position in the current world order. Uh, we have a regional order here in Montenegro, in the Balkans, uh, that was set up after the NATO intervention in Yugoslavia and after the war, wars, wars ended. You have, we have two frozen conflicts. We have peace in the Balkans for the last 20 plus years. But this order is not considered um, it's considered by the current Serbian regime as being not in accordance with their national interests. And that's why Serbia is challenging Gordon in the Balkans. And uh, currently you can see a lot of friction between Croatians and Bosniaks. You, have, you see a lot of frictions between Montenegrins and Albanians. Uh, there are some narratives that are trying to create frictions uh, between Bosniaks and Montenegrins. And with this, what's happening here at the moment, and you can recognize that with the narratives that have been created in order to create problems between Poles and Ukrainians, exploiting their uh, historical grievances and grudges, you have the same situation here in, here in the bulk. So, uh, with the respect what Darko is do, the great respect for what Darko is doing in Serbia and other people in Serbia, uh, I think we should find partners within Serbia and try to help to change the climate in Serbia, which is now highly anti-European. For the first time in Serbian history, there is minority of people that are supporting the EU integration. And NATO was never on the agenda to the majority of the Serbian public, unfortunately. And as someone who's half Serb and who studied in Serbia for, and lived in Serbia for seven years, I can surely say that with, with great assurance that this is the product of the three decades of anti-Western indoctrination. And um, by countering Serbian and Russian propaganda, we should try not to send away people who are coming from these countries. Let them be just a minority, but uh, who may be our allies. And when you talk about the immigration of Russians in Montenegro, and I am coming back to your question and I'm ending here. Uh, yes, there is 30,000 and more Russians present in Montenegro. You have the same number or, or a little bit less number of Ukrainians. You have Turks. And Montenegro is feeling great pressure from the immigration, but much more on the economy than on the informational space. Because uh, the language barrier, the cultural barrier is, and uh, the custom of Russian diaspora of ghettoizing themselves. So they, they're not influencing Montenegrin space. And when they are active, and when they are politically active, they are trying to express their uh, critique of the regime. So I've been supporting them here in, Mount, in Budva when they organize protests. Um, and unfortunately, the Montenegrin government and the new Montenegrin uh, regime is now acting as Serbia's one. Serbia is expelling Russians who are opposition, people who are supporting opposition or are anti-war. Anti and here in my town of Budva, uh, the two pr protests uh, were banned by the local authorities. Anti-Putin protests were banned by the local authorities. So we don't have problem, political problem at the moment with the Russian immigration. The more problems and more pro-Russian, pro-Putin attitude is articulated by the Serbian nationalist forces in Montenegro. 
and uh, you have the paradox that uh, Montenegrin citizens, Serbs and others, are protesting in support for Putin regime, and you have Russian emigration here uh, protesting against the war in Ukraine and against the Putin regime. Also, what is uh, what is interesting, you can see a lot of interaction between Ukrainians and Russians here in Montenegro, not in the public. Uh, and I see how Russians are, are learning, because they're learning, only, only outside of Russia they can learn what is wrong and how wrong is their approach. They're, they're, sometimes they're not aware that but what they are saying and what they, the way they're thinking uh, that you know that they may, may, might hurt the feelings, for example, of Ukrainians. But I've seen a lot of debates. I've witnessed a lot of communication between the people, and I've seen how. Um, and I'm quite positive that Balkans can serve as a place where Russians and Russian citizens can face the crimes of the regime in Ukraine. And though, just like we faced the crimes of our regime in the 90s. Montenegro was, and I'm finishing here for sure, Montenegro is, in the 90s, was a co-aggressor in the Yugoslav war, just like Belarus is now with Russia. And we went through a catharsis period. Uh, when I was a high school student, we watched documentaries about the crimes that were committed in our name. And only when we watched that, those, when we witnessed those crimes, that was quite, for, for me personally, a point where I realized what was wrong with my country and my, my, my government. Uh, so my, uh, my speech here wasn't st structured. Uh, I wanted to share some of the pieces of the narratives that are uh, researching. And hopefully some of those uh, could be used in order to, you know, to create a, some type of blueprint, some kind of blueprint uh, for uh, activities uh, that could build up the resilience of our countries towards, towards Russian propaganda. Thank you very much. Yakui. Thank you, Lubomir, uh, very much. And you uh, mentioned the split between uh, Serbian stance and pro-Russian narratives. So I have just a brief question regarding the latest developments in your country. I mean, the census that was held in Montenegro and one of the leaders of the considered pro-Serbian democratic front, Andrea Mandic, recently elected speaker of the parliament, announced changes to Montenegrin constitution based on the results of the census. And in particular, the declaration of the Serbian language as official. Uh, so what is your prediction whether that may pose a uh, stance of uh, destabilization and uh, whether uh, Serbia or Russia may use this uh, development as a tool uh, to undermine your opinion um, values and support for European Union around uh, uh, and inside uh, society of uh, your country? Thank you very much uh, for the question. Yeah, the uh, pro-Serbian, Serbian nationalist politician uh, Andrija Mandic is uh, who Putin himself considers a great hero of, of the Balkans, how he said in one of his interviews, is now our, currently our speaker. Uh, and um, there is, I think there is no risk at the moment of uh, changing Montenegrin constitutions because several of these articles that are connected with the symbols, Montenegrin national symbols, and, and, and those important articles of, of our constitution, in order to change them, you need to win two thirds of all voters in a referendum. So it's it's quite it's quite complicated to get two thirds of all voters in Montenegro to vote for the changes, and I think that is a uh, that our founding fathers from 2006 and creators of our constitutions were very much, they, they were visionaries, uh, that the, there will be a, uh, 
that there will be uh, uh, attempts to undermine Montenegrin separate identity because what you see and what you, what you mentioned are the attempts to question Montenegrin separate identity, as I said before. Um, yeah, there will be tensions. If you have people like Mr. Andrija Mandic and Milan Knežević, uh, the people who uh, are uh, un indicted by the local courts for their 2016 coup attempt together with Russian secret services, you are always in risk of uh, you know, having in the highest ranking positions in your government people who are agents of Russian influence. It's always complicated. But I have believe in our uh, media freedoms, because Montenegro, even under the 30 years rule of Djukanovic and his party, we had quite free and vibrant media scene. And we have a very strong and resilient so civil society in Montenegro. So without, and being a NATO member also helps. So without any uh, big changes, or as Darko said, uh, if, if these wet dreams of our uh, friends from, from Serbian nationalist organizations that the Russians will arrive on their tanks on Danube, and then we will, as they say in their narratives, fly you know, hang on, cling on to the American planes, just like Afghanis did uh, in, in, in Afghanistan a couple of years ago. So that, these narratives are, uh, are not dangerous. But if something huge happens on geopolitical scene, if there will be some tectonic changes, if Ukraine loses war, God forbid, and then we're next. So that's why your struggle and your fight is our fight. And I would be more happy if we could, as a society, sit the West, understand that much better than we do right now. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Lubomir, for this inspiring uh, speech. And now I'd like to ask uh, Samir Bishevich uh, to tell us more about uh, Russian inf information challenges uh, regarding uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and what are the main uh, toolkit of uh, Russian influence uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, well, uh, first of all, let me thank uh, for uh, invitation to being here today. Uh, let, let me again greet uh, uh, previous speakers and thanks them for a very detailed and comprehensive uh, overview of what's, of what's going on uh, in Balkans uh, and how it's connected with Ukraine. Um, me personally being here in Kiev in the last uh, six, seven months uh, uh, give me some more uh, perspective of how important for Ukraine is to be uh, more concerned with, with what's going on in Balkans, uh, especially after um, what's being said yesterday uh, or the day before yesterday when uh, uh, Putin gave that interview to uh, to Tucker and uh, how we uh, now analyze the uh, Serbian influence and Serbian uh, 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 the, uh, historical uh, negation, uh, negation of uh, uh, Bosnia, Croatia, and uh, of course Montenegro uh, sovereign, as a sovereign state. We can see how it's uh, how it's similar uh, situation with uh, with U Ukraine and. Uh, between Ukraine and Balkans. So uh, what I prepare for, for today, it will just scratch the surface of the, um, of the Russia influence in Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, because it's uh, very big, uh, it, uh, it's very big and strong uh, considering the, the Bosnian constitution and uh, uh, two entities uh, and 
one of the for for the people who uh, watching this uh, must, must, I must repeat that Bosnia is constituted from uh, two entities, and one of them is Republic Srps, Republic of Srpska. And uh, when describing Russia, R Russia's impact on Bosnian media and society, a crucial point, focal point emerged, which is Bosnian entity name, Republic of Srpska. It stands as a bastion of complete Russian informational and political domination. It's, as I said, the, the evidence uh, uh, around that it's uh, very abundant, uh, ranging from frequent meetings between uh, Republika Srpska politicians and their Russian counterpart, counterparts. And investors, of course, which are Russian investors uh, who are present in Republic of Srpska. Uh, but also, we cannot forget uh, pre uh, President of Republic of Srpska Dodik meetings with Putin, uh, and uh, new meetings were announced uh, by the end of last year. But. It didn't happen, but you, uh, despite all sanctions, despite all, uh, let's say, uh, international pressure to Republic of Srpska, uh, to Bosnia Herzegovina, uh, government of Republic of Srpska doesn't breach any uh, relationship with 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 Russia. We still remember the famous case of Lavrov visit uh, to Republic of Srpska and uh, Dodik who gifted him with an icon stolen from the temporarily occupied territory of Ukraine. And uh, we, we remember that case, uh, it was in, in years past, but uh, uh, it's also evident that uh, Russia today uh, announced its um, establishment of it, it, its uh, its office or w whatever it been, would be called in Republic of Srpska, uh, despite the fact that uh, it's banned. R Russia today is banned from 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 Europe. So, uh, uh, from the part of Republic of Srpska, we can see a copy paste of uh, the um, some laws that have been implemented for some time, for s several years in in Russia, uh, like is the recent law endorsed by the Republic of Srpska. Uh, government mandating foreign funded non profits in Bosnia in uh, Republic of Srpska to report the, their activities and report financial flows to the justice uh, to, to the Ministry of Justice of Republic of Srpska. So uh, Dodik and uh, really decide to uh, put under his control even. But the, 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 the uh, existing uh, independent uh, civil society uh, embedded in, in some non-governmental organization. Uh, when we when we comes to another entity of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is predominantly home of uh, Bosniaks, which uh, are Muslims of Croats, which is Roman Catholics, uh, some similar scenarios are unfolding, currently unfolding. Uh, but uh, still, uh, uh, in the Federation of Bosnia Herzegovina, uh, we can notice some uh, of resistance against Russian influence through the independent media, fact-checking platforms, and some NGOs. Uh, and as I mentioned uh, before, uh, th th there are also some transformation. Uh, 
um, make a market by a notable change in public sentiment. Uh, initially supportive of, U of Ukraine during the onset of the total war in 2022, there is now a, a shift uh, in the public opinion of Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina and a shift towards animosity against the EU, NATO and the broad and western sphere. Uh, these, uh, these uh, let's say, uh, public thoughts uh, helps uh, position Russia as a potentially superior, superior partner to Bosnia compared to the EU and NATO. For example, if would uh, Bosnia join BRICS, uh, for, for Bosnia it would be much better than, than joining EU. Uh, Russia influence extends to manipulation and intimidation taxes exploit, exploiting issues deeply sensitive to Bosnian citizens, which um, still remember uh, horrors of the last war in Bosnia when uh, the siege of Sarajevo uh, uh, and uh, lack of uh, heating, food, and so on, uh, deeply suffer uh, uh, Bosnian citizens. So, uh, anxiety or potential gas supply disruption due to war in Ukraine uh, uh, lead to fears that uh, push Bosnian well, uh, I, I remember how it was in, uh, in the beginning of uh, total war in Ukraine that uh, you couldn't buy uh, an electrical um, heating system or wooden stove because uh, uh, people were feared that there will be no more gas from, from, from Russia. Uh, and uh, this narrative uh, persists in in the public sphere uh, in 2023, accompanied by the blame on Ukraine resistance for increased inflation and uh, increase of uh, food prices. You know, uh, uh, you could see a lot, a lot of uh, comments and uh, uh, analytics that uh, contribute uh, uh, this situation that Bosnia will uh, have a less uh, or uh, will have no gas or the increased price of gas or increased price of the food just because uh, Ukraine didn't surrender, surrendered. So, uh, but now I would come to nowadays and um, what was really the, the, the turning moment uh, in uh, dominating public opinion in Federation of Bosnia Herzegovina, uh, which occurred after the Hamas terrorist attack on Israel and uh, Israel's subsequent anti-terrorist action. Russia, Russia uh, deeply manipulate the religious sentiments of Bosnian Muslim, which makes a uh, majority in Federation of Bosnia Herzegovina, uh, in Federation of Bosnia Herzegovina, uh, aligning them with Palestinians as victims of the perceived uh, uh, malevolence of the West and United States. Simultaneously, Ukrainians and Israelis were cast as executors of alleged nefarious policies dictated by the US and EU. This strategic maneuvering deeply influenced uh, many editors uh, of uh, news of media who are uh, Muslim religions, uh, so they create uh, uh, an open space 
for Russia to de disseminate that kind of news that uh, put uh, put somehow uh, Bosnian Muslim and Palestinians in the same in the same uh, basket or ship, whatever. Uh, and um, uh, bringing Rush Russia and uh, Russia a fight against the Western democracy and uh, NATO as a uh, find uh, as a fight for uh, for something that will be prosperous for for Muslim all all around the world. So many Bosnia of Muslim religion bite uh, bite that uh, as a as a granted and they now really somehow don't like uh, that Ukraine is uh, kind of giving the the, 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 the the resistance or fighting Russia uh, because it's they, they, they bring that uh, on the same level uh, as uh, Israel as Israel and uh, I will just finish with the um, with with the very recent uh, publications on, uh, on the most popular internet portal in uh, Bosnia Herzegovina, named Clicks.ba, uh, which uh, and uh, exemplified by the Tucker Putin, Putin interview and the and um, article about uh, Zaluzhny. Uh, 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 how uh, I just want to 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 like to to show you how the, uh, the um, this very popular and uh, a few years ago heavily funded by the, the by the EU and in, uh, very progressive inter portal now changes its narrative and uh, gives space uh, uh, actually the, the, uh, it's not the, the, the Russia that uh, that write the, 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 these articles it's the, just the, the uh, journal, journalist or uh, um, as I said um, uh, um, editor that in, uh, describe it. So the Tucker interview was uh, translated to present him as a as an impartial journalist engaging ordinary political leaders and uh, completely defecting focus from Russia's Russia's role as an aggressor and putting alleged involvement in, in international crimes. Uh, similar, uh, similarly to that, an article discussing uh, Zaluzhny's change portrayed it as a consequence of internal weaknesses within Ukraine army and political leadership, coupled with disagreement with U.S. military and NATO. So, it, it, it's been uh, right. The, these articles were uh, written by the, the Bosnian journalist. It's not the. the but the fact that uh, some somebody uh, wrote for them, or it were translated from, or um, from Sputnik or Russia Today, or whatever, it's it's piece of uh, the Bosnian journalist work. So uh, the, the the situation in in Bosnia and Herzegovina is uh, very difficult, uh, uh, and. What can be done? I can only agree with my previous uh, previous uh, uh, speakers and colleagues. So we, we uh, more attention on from the whole of uh, Ukraine poli politics must be put uh, and stronger presence of uh, um, Ukraine uh, foreign policy must be. Uh, Put or, or must be invest in uh, in Balkans and Bosnia, particularly, which doesn't even have Ukrainian embassy, and uh, it has only 
a representation of, uh, of, uh, of embassy from Zagreb. So uh, I think uh, a lot needs to be done uh, concerning uh, Bosnia and its relationship with Ukraine and uh, countering uh, Russia influence. Uh, thank you so much, Samir, for this uh, picture of uh, Russian influence in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, but uh, I'd like to ask you in, in brief about the uh, hot topic of last days, I mean, interview with uh, Putin and uh, Tucker Carlson. So how local, uh, local societies may... Uh, may May you uh, may perceive this interview and what uh, thesis that were voiced by Russian president may may find a ground uh, among uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, other countries from your perspective. Well, I will just to to respond to this question. I will just come back to the uh, what colleagues uh, said before that the, the same narrative of uh, uh, void f former Yugoslavia, uh, the same narrative of Serbian uh, and justification for, for uh, Serbian uh, aggression to Bosnia, to Croatia, and this uh, situation with Mont Montenegro, the same narrative uh, was used by the Putin, and uh, which said, uh, which were said in, in the time of Yugosla Yugoslavian wars, that uh, 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 Croatia or Bosnia or Montenegro are just uh, Serbian territories. These countries are uh, just artificial countries uh, established in some. Uh, period of time under uh, the, uh, in concrete case of uh, Yugoslavia, in the time of ruling of Tito, uh, like uh, Putin said, uh, for Stalin or for Lenin regarding Ukraine. So um, uh, uh, this just gives some more uh, uh, wind or more arguments for all these Serbian nationalists uh, to continue Continue where they stopped uh, in the 90s when uh, when war was over in the 90s. So it's just a frozen conflict that uh, Russia uh, would uh, not, uh, uh, slowly heat up and uh, uh, trying to to uh, to uh, to preserve. When, uh, when they finished conflict in Ukraine, and then they will really put the flame on, on the Balkans. Thank you so much. And uh, do we have any questions from our audience? No. OK, so if we, yes, we have uh, several minutes for points from our participants, so I give the floor to you. Uh, yes, thank you. Very briefly, regarding uh, EU, NATO, strategic communications, Ukraine and uh, Balkans. For us, it's really very important to understand that uh, the EU, um, uh, the perception of EU and NATO is different in Ukraine and Balkans. And uh, um, in Ukraine, uh, the EU is uh, perceived uh, more optimistic, more positive. Yes, Ukraine was granted the candidate status in June 2022, and in December the negotiations started. Uh, at the same time, uh, NATO is perceived in Ukraine as uh, like uh, uh, bureaucratic uh, structure and. Uh, uh, the situation is at some point different in Balkans because uh, uh, they want uh, also to join the EU and they've been waiting for almost uh, 20 years uh, uh, with uh, candidate status. And uh, if uh, the EU and NATO won't change their information approach uh, regarding uh, Balkans, uh, there will be much uh, worse uh, situation. Um, uh, so uh, we must also uh, uh, 
uh, affect uh, strategic communications uh, in Brussels and uh, we are in the same basket uh, like uh, the Western Balkans, uh, Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova uh, and if they are willing and want to uh, make the bold uh, decisions uh, only by doing this uh, we can help uh, to win this war. Another very uh, important point is that we must uh, present our Ukraine's vision regarding particularly the Balkans, uh, the Balkans region. I mean, what uh, Ukraine's uh, victory means to those countries. And uh, this is a discussion, uh, this is a topic for another discussion, just simply to form our narratives, uh, how our victory will improve, for example, social economic situation in this country. Thank you. Thank you, Ihor. And uh, I, I think that uh, Katarina have a few words, uh, finally. To say. Uh, yes. uh, I thought uh, comment uh, to uh, to uh, answer uh, of Igor and uh, other other speakers. Uh, we um, uh, we spoke about uh, Putin uh, Putin's uh, interview uh, uh, Russian propaganda, and uh, we uh, forget about. Uh, uh, that we can uh, to create uh, a good cooperation between us and between our um, institution and between our uh, think tanks. We uh, starting uh, this cooperation, but uh, not um, uh, have a good uh, develop uh, development in uh, last uh, last uh, months. Uh, Ro uh, Russians. Uh, has a good uh, network in in the uh, Ukrainian in the uh, Balkan uh, countries. Uh, Russian uh, institution uh, use uh, this uh, in, uh, network uh, for um, power soft uh, for um, fight uh, against uh, um, Ukrainian narrative. Ukraine. Uh, and Balkan uh, uh, countries uh, will uh, change to informational uh, approach uh, and uh, share our narrative about our uh, our war crimes, our history, because uh, Putin and pro uh, pro Russian journalists in the uh, world, in the Europe, in the Balkan uh, uh, countries. Uh, constantly uh, use uh, anti-Ukrainian uh, narrative, anti-Ukrainian narrative connected uh, with uh, uh, history and uh, uh, history uh, which uh, uh, Putin share in this region. Thank you. Thank you, Katarina. So we have plenty of uh, ideas to implement and I, uh, I would like to thank to all participants for your time and your ideas, your great contribution. So one of the main consequences is uh, the idea of how to bring and to explain Ukraine to Western Balkan societies in their general aim to promote European integration in all our societies and that is a issue of great importance but anyway we have still much work to do and hopefully this event will be not the last and soon we will gather once more to discuss latest developments and forecast future developments thank you and stay tuned and follow the events of Ukraine Crisis Media Center. Goodbye.